Okay, welcome to the hangar. It's open hangar Thursday. We got special guest Scott Monroe, childhood friend. We went to A&P <laughs> school together back in what was that 1982? 80, 80, 81. So I just come out of high school, Scott. You come out of the paint shop or something. <laughs> yeah, I was in the auto body business, airplane nut, just like one and decided to go ahead and join all the other airplane nuts. But then our careers diverged. I uh, went to college and got into Air Force ROTC and went the military route, fixed wing route, airline route. Scott, you never did get a degree, but went the ro Army we rotor wing? Worked as an AMP, so we got our mechanic AP license for a while, and yeah, we, I worked for a couple years trying to get the ratings. Uh, didn't have the college or anything, got, didn't get that out of the way, so I wasn't qualified. I also had some vision problems, which were later That's corrected. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time that, that happened, um, the Army was accepting with two years of college, so I went ahead and became the rotary wing pilot. So, um, I'm an airplane guy at heart, chose rotary wing to make a living in aviation and I love it, but um, I also have my foot in both worlds. I fly my own airplane. You got an old Bonanza out there. I got a Bonanza, yeah. I still keep current and everything yeah. in airplanes. Majority of my time is in helicopters and that's the way I make my living, so. Yeah, and you're currently working as a uh, EMS pilot? Right, one of the major uh, providers, EMS air ambulance helicopter provider here in Northern California. And unlike a uh, airline pilot career, which is pretty linear, helicopters, you're kind of all over career-wise. There's many pathways. I, I, there's no real parallel that I can see in a fixed-wing aviation other than maybe crop dusting or something like that mm -hmm. as a sideline. Uh, you could fly utility in the mountains, power line patrol, you could fly news, which I did for a yeah, number you, of years. That's uh, right. You could fly EMS, uh, you could fly charter, uh, sightseeing, all sorts of things. It's a very versatile machine and that's why there's so many career paths I think. So we're going to talk about the recent incident with uh, the S-76B crash in Southern California. Let's take it back to before the, the helicopter even leaves the ground. Initially I said that this crew had a choice to go VFR or IFR. We've now learned that this operation was strictly VFR qualified only. It's a charter operation it's VFR only, so so they don't have the choice to go right. to IFR. That takes that option out of the out of the equation, right? So they can only depart VFR. They depart Orange County and head up towards Burbank and do a couple of circles. What are they doing there? Well, because the weather was IFR, uh, that is ceilings less than a thousand feet or visibility less than three miles. All of the fixed wing traffic or anybody that's on an IFR flight plan is going into Van Nuys, where they were holding short of on IFR flight plans, shooting approaches. Uh, they can only allow, ATC will only allow one aircraft at a time within that five statute mile radius of Van Nuys. That's their controlled airspace for instrument approaches. So when that's in use, they have to wait between approaches and then they can clear the VFR helicopter under special VFR conditions through the class Delta, which he wanted to do just to transition to get to where he's going. And that special VFR allowed them to operate in conditions down to a one mile visibility or even less in the case of helicopters? Well. In helicopters, part 135 is half a mile during the day and one mile at night. Uh, so down to a, down to a mile or a half a mile I should during say. the day. During special the day. VFR, correct for part FAR part 135 one charter that's, operations, that's which right. is the FAR part that this flight was operating right. under. So again, it's part 135 VFR only. And then once he gets past that airspace, he can just continue on VFR squawking 1200, which is the standard code on the transponder and continue VFR even uh, as low as he was, he was probably even in uncontrolled airspace. Right? Yeah, even in class golf airspace, uncontrolled airspace, I hadn't had a chance to really look at the sectional to see if that was true, but more than likely, uh, he could fly his visibility as low as a half mile under part 135 during the day. Part Again, 135. Right, 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 right. But I have to make the point too that when mm -hmm. he went through Van Nuys airspace under special VFR, that's routine. That's, there's no problem with doing that. Mm -hmm. The weather was reported at 1,100 and uh, two and a half miles, I believe. Mm -hmm. That's almost VFR. Yeah. That is a piece of cake in a helicopter. You can slow down and do that at 90 knots all day long, no problem. Perfectly routine, perfectly safe, no red flags at that point with the flight. Because the deteriorating weather really got deteriorated towards right. the end of the flight. Now, what about everybody else saying they were grounded at the time uh, of this flight? Well, in the local area of Calabasas, yes. Um, you would be able to take off Van Nuys from a helicopter with a helicopter, no problem. Again, 1,100 and two and a half miles, no problem. Mm -hmm. You can depart. Mm -hmm. There was nothing wrong with this flight, in my mind, that the pilot did until he 
stuck his nose up into rising terrain and, and mountain obscuration. Those are big red flags, and he would know that checking a, a weather report prior to departure. Mm -hmm. So now let's talk a bit about the pilot's qualifications um, and the mission of the helicopter. The pilot was a CF double I helicopter. That means he's right. an instrument instructor in helicopters, right. but he's working for a VFR part 135 operation. What are the implications of that? Well, first off, I found it astounding that a double I, someone that is teaching a person to fly instruments on helicopters, apparently is not competent enough to control the helicopter. Now, I, I don't want to be too hard on this guy. He's a very experienced guy. He has similar, I have similar hours that he has, similar ages, probably similar, maybe similar background. I don't know if he was military trained, uh, but it is apparent right now that he lost control of the helicopter while transitioning onto instruments. And for a double eye to have that happen to him is really just, there's just no excuse in my mind to hold that ticket. However, it's just a rating and you have to maintain proficiency. If you're not doing it, you're not teaching it, whatever. Yeah. Just because atrophy. you have the rating doesn't necessarily mean you're proficient at that skill. It's like if I have a motorcycle add-on rating to my driver's license, but I never ride a motorcycle, how good am I going to be on a motorcycle? Mm -hmm. you know, I have a rating. Yeah, it says I'm qualified, but this is not a skill that you, you have to keep it up. You know? Now, what is it about the, uh, the market down there in Southern California? So your VFR only, but you've got an instrument rating, but mm -hmm. you're always operating in VFR conditions, right? right? So you right. never exercise well and that's the problem um, the very nature of the helicopter's mission it's a very utilitarian machine the IFR structure is set up for airplanes to fly airport to airport if I was flying to Van Nuys I would know that the airport was VFR well it wasn't VFR but it was 1103 mm -hmm. I know I can plan about that the utility of the helicopter he's going to try to land now in um, a ball field uh, over in Calabasas, a gymnasium where they're teaching, uh, coaching a game. Mm -hmm. That's the utility of a helicopter. It's the purpose of it. Mm -hmm. If you want to go to an airport, you just get an airplane. It's much more efficient. Um, but the helicopter can land wherever. The problem with that is you don't have weather reporting at this place. What is it like in Calabasas? I don't know. You have to go by an area forecast. Mm -hmm. You have to know weather patterns and things mm -hmm. like this. But you really don't know what the weather is going to be there. At your destination. At your, so you have to go take a look. You either say, well, I don't like it and you never fly. Or you go have a look, and that's, I deal with this today even, you know, we go by area forecasts, which are notoriously unreliable, mm -hmm. to a, some place that doesn't really have weather reporting, and you go have a look. You've got to have an out. you got to leave yourself a way out, and then we talk about helicopters um, can fly considerably slower, but we've talked about in the past why you can't hover in IMC conditions. Right. Why is that? Well. Well, the aircraft has some aerodynamic quirks, there's no secret to that. Um, in forward flight above, say, 30 knots or so, they behave very much like an airplane. Engineers take a lot of time to try to make them fly with stability like an airplane is certified to do. Varying success <laughs> depending on the type. You get below about 30 knots and it starts to get into a hover mode. The instruments are set up for flying forward, where they fly like an airplane. There are instruments available in military applications, primarily in search and rescue, Coast Guard and things like that, that will hover, that can enable the pilot to hover, and even autopilots that are programmed to hover a helicopter, but that is not generally the case. The aerodynamics, the physics of it are completely different. There are no cues, for instance, to tell me that I'm flying backwards, mm -hmm. which a helicopter can do to hover. There's nothing on the panel that will tell me that. Mm -hmm. uh, or sideways. Or you start does. drifting left or you right. No. Yeah. So the instrument the instrument flying can only be done in forward flight above about 30 knots. It's otherwise very easy to lose control, to get uh, spatial disorientation. Easy. I couldn't do it. Uh, the military, the Army taught us to do it, but I tell you, that was an extremely perishable skill. I couldn't do it today. Uh, it took lots of practice to do it right from the ground. So, yeah. Um, so then there's this discussion about the aircraft doesn't have terrain avoidance warning system. Yeah. Uh, you've got it in your ships we do. now. Right, it's required in the EMS helicopters now. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, how, do you, how, do you avoid, how do you prevent it from becoming a nuisance when you're operating like in this particular flight at such a low altitude to begin with? Well, 
For one thing, had I been conducting this flight, this is me, mm -hmm. uh, I will go into an area with mountain obscuration only during the day. Mm -hmm. I would have the HTAWS pulled up, and there's a screen on there that tells you in various you know, green, yellow, and red mm -hmm. terrain around you and distances. So I know situationally where the mountains are. I give myself enough. I know how much time it takes to turn around. And based on that, uh, you can go have a look. It's, it's dangerous. There is a risk involved with that. You have to know when to call, you know, cry uncle and turn around. Or, you know, before what happened, happened. But so that, that, and that's the way I would, I would do it. But the nuisance warnings, we do get that all the time. Mm -hmm. We'll go to a scene, uh, especially at night, and uh, we're circling over an accident scene with terrain up here in Grass Valley. Mm -hmm. And you're getting all these terrain warnings. Terrain, terrain. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're aware of it. We want you to be quiet now. We have a button on the panel and we can silence that. So you silence, it's an audible, it's an audio warning, right. terrain, terrain, you silence that, you still got the visual cue there, but Correct. you know... You're aware of it, Yeah. under certain conditions, you know... Can you tune that audio warning down to a hundred feet? No, uh, no, not on ours, just, not on ours, oh. it's fixed, it's all programmed, uh, we don't have any control of that, all you really have is an inhibit button, or hmm. you can turn it completely off. Ooh. And that was uh, the case in a... Alaska Senator Stevens accident re regarding CFIT. It was a fixed wing accident. They found the terrain warning system was turned off or inhibited. Uh, right. Oh, would have would have would have TAWS or H TAWS helped in this case? Do you think? Not in my opinion. Um, this pilot was very experienced of the local area. He knew where the terrain was. He knew he'd been through the pass many times. Um, so. Really, it's just going to, you know, he already knew what he was doing. He knew where the terrain was. It wasn't helping him. He knew that he was in trouble. He I'm already sure. knew that he was very low to the terrain. Correct. Yeah. yeah. You're just very familiar with the area. You don't need an h -Taz telling you, uh, hey, you're too close to the terrain. He's well aware of that. So. And then in the end, he was trying to climb up, and he was climbing up and away and getting right. safely away from the train before right. he apparently got disoriented and lost right. control of the helicopter. So towards the end of the flight, the helicopter makes a left-hand turn towards rising terrain. One of the possible theories that some commenters came up with was, was he looking for a way out in the form of that sheriff's helicopter pad just off to the left of the highway? And you don't think that may be necessarily the case? No, because the fact that he climbed. Um, I've been in these situations before and I've read many accident cases, uh, survivors of these incidents where they did manage to somehow maintain control of the helicopter. And, uh, at all costs, they're getting lower and slower to try to maintain contact, visual contact with the ground. The fact that he climbed away means to me that he's accepted the fact that he's invert an IMC and he's attempting to do the proper thing, climb away from terrain and recover. Well, how do we corroborate this with the eyewitness with the TWA hat down there by the right. church? He says he flew over slowly. It would seem to me he would be making the left turn, flying slowly, looking for the helipad, which would be right about where the church location mm -hmm. was, and then he disappears into the soup or the fog mm -hmm. and then he initiates his possibly. emergency IMC climb. I suppose it's possible, but like I think you pointed out, the sheriff's pad was on the right. He makes a left turn. No, no, the sheriff's pad was on the left. No, it was on the left. Okay. Yeah. I suppose it's possible. Hmm. Uh, yeah, that is a possibility then. But how are we ever going to know without a data, right. a voice we recorder? Don't know what they were looking for yeah. or anything like this. It's mm -hmm. just, um, yeah. Might remain a mystery. Correct, yeah. helicopter doesn't stall like a fixed wing aircraft. The rotors can stall. This doesn't seem to be much of a factor on this, but can you, <laughs> in 500 words or less, uh, can you give us the vortex, <laughs> what do you call it? Vortex ring state, yeah, or settling with power. And it's something you have to be aware of in a helicopter when you're hovering and descending for the landing primarily. Um, the, basically, there's little tornadoes on the wing uh, of any airplane or any airfoil. Wing tip vortices. Yeah, exactly. Uh, on a helicopter, it's no different. It forms a sort of a donut. And as you descend, if you get more than about 300 feet per minute in a vertical rate of descent, you're ingesting the vortices back into the rotor from the top, circulating them. And that reduces the, uh, or increases the angle of attack of blades, rather. And uh, the blades start to stall in an uneven fashion. You lose lift, and applying power only makes it worse. Uh, it just increases the vortices, 
and ingests it even more. So it makes what you have to do is actually fly out of that forward or laterally uh, into clean air where the, the, the rotor is no longer ingesting that ring. But again, this is only a factor if you're hovering and descending at right. the same time. Correct. At, at, at what kind right. of rate of descent? 300 foot per minute or greater. And then you can be right. susceptible to this. Or a downwind approach. If you're a downwind approach and you're flying at 30 knots and you have a 30 knot tailwind, oh. you're in the same condition. Mm -hmm. you know, the wind is following you. Kind of like and you can feel that imbalance and oh, then yeah. you can immediately... The helicopter correct, can roll right. over, it can do all sorts of various things, unusual attitudes, all sorts of things. But unlikely in this case because I why? I don't think so. I have a feeling, I don't know. This is the thing that's interesting to me. Uh, it, it is quite possible that, you know, he was initiating a go around, uh, inadvertent IMC, he's trying to climb out. If you let the aircraft get slow, we talked about how you can't hover it on instruments. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think he was descending vertically. He was climbing away. You have a rate yeah. of climb going, so it's really impossible to get into vortex ring state under those conditions. So it's more likely just plain old IMC disorientation, right. spatial disorientation. And, and not to fault the pilot too much, if he did indeed get too slow, he was going slow and then pulled the nose up a little bit, you can get below that 20, 30 knots and then nobody could pull it off, proficiency-wise or not. IMC on instruments and a slow right. and a hover. You've got to keep the forward speed. A piece of trivia. Did you know that that canyon is the opening sequence for the MASH program? Is that the right? The MASH set is right there I'll be in done. that canyon. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. One of the questions the media was asking was during the final rate of descent, was that a recoverable rate of descent Ugh, wow. in a helicopter? I, that's an extreme. We're talking 4,000 feet per minute or so. Yeah. Uh, for only about 1,000 feet, that's an obscene <laughs> rate of descent. I, I maximum rate of descent that I'll use in routine operations is maybe 1,500. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, anything more than 1,000 is getting my attention because it's just pretty extreme. You have, that's a big helicopter and you have that sort of mass mm -hmm. going. Uh, even if you got visual and he was coming down that fast in the last few seconds, there's, you, you can't recover. There's no room. Too know. much smash. You have enough momentum. There's nothing direction. you can do at yep. that point. What has the aeromedical, well, what do you call it, aerovac? Aerovac, aeromedical, air ambulance. What has the air ambulance industry done in recent years to improve their safety record? Uh, they've had quite a bit of technological changes right. that this helicopter did, did not have. You right. mentioned TAWS. Right. H-TAWS, which is Helicopter Specific Terrain Awareness uh, Warning System. Um, that's one. Uh, years ago, they uh, required all EMS helicopters have radar altimeters, mm -hmm. uh, which sends a signal of actual height above the ground mm -hmm. from 2,000 feet on down. Because so most altimeters read MSL. Right, and your altimeter level. barometric errors, all things can creep in. In our low altitude environment, 1,000 feet or below, these errors can be significant. So the RA, the radar altimeter, is, is a requirement. Um, They've also raised some uh, weather minimums for Part 135 EMS. Uh, there's a whole table of certain conditions, like the lowest we can really go now uh, is 800 foot ceiling and two miles visibility. That's the absolute lowest that EMS can fly a VFR. And that's really kind of below my personal minimums. I would not want to go out in, in that weather. But in the old days, we used to go out with half a mile and you had to go take a look at it. It was very dangerous. And the record, the accident record reflected that danger. It was pretty horrific. Uh, if you want to fly, are you certified uh, EMS IFR operations? Yes. And in order to be certified IFR operations, you got to have what requirements? Well, you take a check ride every six months for one thing, uh, instead of an once a year, an ride. instrument check ride specifically to check you out and retrain and, and refresh all, all of these skills that are, like I talked about, are perishable, and especially in the helicopter world. That's probably why this operator was VFR only. They felt that under the, for their business, they really did not need to spend the money and uh, the recurrency and all the things that that takes to maintain an IFR currency. The few missions that it would require that they would not be able to take uh, was not worth uh, the money in increased training. So because this pilot had an instrument rating, because he was flying for a VFR operator, he was not probably not getting regular six-month IFR currency I almost check rights? I guarantee you, correct. That's correct. Wow. Um, wow. And that's the problem yep. with helicopter flying. Uh, as I spoke of the utility of the helicopter, 
you want to be able to fly to these places, but you don't have weather reporting, so you have to go take a look. And now you're into areas where you're, you're poking your nose into an area that is bad weather, and because of the, the FAA doesn't want to get rid of the utility of the helicopter, so they let it fly in lower visibility and weather minimums, VFR, visually, because it can slow down. So you're flying in this weather that, that, that is worse, and because the helicopter pilot flies 99% of the time purely visual, his skills in instrument recovery atrophy. So the same mission mm -hmm. that enables, that puts him in the position of getting in bad weather has also caused the instrument flying skills to atrophy. atrophy. Wow. And so you've got a marriage there that is not working out. In my opinion, it's been going on for years and it needs to be addressed, I believe, in the training side. It's, it becomes a training problem. Right, because you don't want to get rid of the utility of the helicopter. That's the whole reason it exists is to go fly these kinds of missions. I want to go to the ball field. I want to go to the helipad like I do, mm -hmm. I, you know, point to point. It, and part of that utility kind of still requires special VFR Yes, capability. and you don't want to get rid of that. Mm -hmm. um, my idea, unbelievably, you can, you can go get an instrument rating in a helicopter, and the vast majority of civilian helicopter pilots have done this in, say, an R-22, uh, CB-300 or some small helicopter that is not even certified to fly in the weather but has the required instruments. They put on a view limiting device, a mm -hmm. hood, which mm -hmm. really doesn't work that good. You yeah. can cheat, mm -hmm. you can see out, and the slightest cue that you can see reinforce it. it's cheating. Mm -hmm. You can get your entire instrument rating that way mm -hmm. and have never been inside a cloud. Mm -hmm. And I hate to tell you that that's a dirty little secret that 90% of the pilots out there that fly mm -hmm. in helicopters just have that ticket so they can fly commercially. It's required, mm -hmm. but they never use it again and they never intend to. You mentioned a uh, IFR minimum requirement for EMS. Mm -hmm. What was that uh, minimum number of hours of actual IMC? Well, our company restricts even experienced pilots uh, when they're flying IFR and newly uh, brought into the company. They increase their minimums by 400 feet ceiling and one mile of visibility. In other words, you tack those minimums 400 feet above the minimums to the approach. Mm -hmm. They don't want a guy going out brand new shooting right to minimums. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's a dicey situation. They want it to be clear cut, you break out, good. Mm -hmm. Okay, for the first year. I would propose a similar thing be done to address this training issue, getting an instrument rating. It, a pilot that gets an instrument rating would be restricted to 1,003 during the day, 1,500 feet and five miles at night until he gets 25 hours, let's say, of, of actual, actual instrument time in the clouds in a helicopter. And then what? Then what? Can, can he then go he the can minimums? get, then, right. Well, then you can address, you know, do we have higher minimums for another 25, something like that? Mm -hmm. We don't know, but data would have to support that. Mm -hmm. Clearly, we've got enough data that there's a problem with lack of proficiency on basic instrument flying by helicopter pads. Yep. It's a problem. Mm. And I think that needs to be addressed. Yep, training issue. Right. Man. Do you got any stories to tell us about your media days? <laughs> I want to hear about your media days. What was it flying for the uh, for the media? Did you have to go out and make a story? What is it that kind of no, burned you out on that? No, I, it's well. For, go ahead. Oh, I got another. Ride. No, it's go. It's uh, it's television news is weird. Anybody that watches has got to know that. Please. Uh, it's so full of hype and everything, and they've, you know, the bottom line becomes in that business, I think, in my opinion, again, being, I flew news for six years, mm -hmm. don't turn the channel at all costs, please do not look away, you know, <laughs> that's the motivating factor. So I have to say that, yeah, some of the stories, I would get a little, uh, my wrist slap for minimizing the story. Oh, yeah. you'd show <laughs> so up and say, oh, there's nothing here to see. Well, it looks pretty good, but they got it under control. No, no, no. This has got to be a disaster. Please, elaborate. You know, this is, don't look, this is not compelling, you know. Well, this just to rub me the wrong way a little bit, but I'm just a guy. I'm I, like I'm, here on the Blanco Lirio yeah, channel, we're right. constantly we keeping you on the edge of your seat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What is he going to do next? Now, now the, the, the company that you used to work for has a helicopter pilot that doesn't say anything. Well, and that's the thing. Um, when they go on air, that costs more money. Uh, 
they call it talent, right? So a guy that just flies them stooge that flies the helicopter around they, is cheap, you know. Really? They oh just yeah. Different. Of when they go so on the air. So if I was a helicopter pilot, I was a big time personality. Oh yeah. If, I you're, if you're talking on the air, they give you probably double what they get. Really? Yeah. yeah or wow. Quite a bit more. Yeah. I'm in the wrong business. I, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> I need a big mustache. No, 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 that's now, right. didn't, didn't that industry get in trouble for for hamming it up too much? Uh, there was a. a I'm not a, aware a, of that. Uh, no, I'm not aware. Arizona? of that is yeah. just no oh well no there was an accident in Arizona which was a mid-air collision that yeah. I'm aware of but that didn't have anything to do with that aspect of it, it was just too many flies dangers of yeah, super ones in the same place which yeah. brings up the point you got TCAS in your EMS ships too, correct yeah. yeah traffic collision avoidance right, systems right. Yeah. yeah another important which helps a lot feature. I, I have to say we get more warnings with that flying around um, you know the Bay Area uh, San Francisco yeah, it helps. There's mm -hmm. a lot of people out there flying, and it, it certainly does give me a heads up. Good. Air tankers got that now too. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Scott. Right. That was a Good lot of deep again. insight, man, into the <laughs> helicopter industry and the training issues that the industry faces. Yeah. I hope it's a. I hope something happens here. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, I believe it was 1959 when the you know they called the day the music died. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Richie Valens, uh, the big bopper. And um, how and, many uh, celebrity Buddy accidents Holly. have we seen of this? Same because scenario, right? They yeah. gotta go. They gotta get there. They mm -hmm. and they're getting these mm -hmm. charter operations, and they're and it's usually dealing with the weather. And an interesting little tidbit: Part 135, as you described, came about because of that accident, the Buddy Holly accident, flying exactly. a bonanza of all things yeah. in, in a snowstorm in Iowa. Mm -hmm. um, the public outrage was so great that the FAA finally stepped in and started regulating charter. Yeah. Let's yeah. hope they do the same thing here. We can't. Stevie lose Ray Vaughan, Bill stupid, Graham, yeah, same old stupid problem. All right. Yep. All right. See you here. Bye.